school in Texas. I was in the fourth graduating class from the school there. Um, before that, I was an engineering major at the University of Texas. I was in the aerospace engineering program in, in the engineering honors program. And when I got into osteopathic medicine, I didn't know what a DO was. And most of the people didn't either. The health professions office at the University of Texas did not even know that there was an osteopathic school in, in Denton at the time at North Texas State. But um, I had to do some running around and find out about our school. I got to go to the state legislature my sophomore year and watch us be voted in as a state medical school. And I got to see the school go through the metamorphosis of being a private college into becoming a state university. It's now one of the seven state medical schools in Texas. I went into practice in Phoenix. I did family practice for five years and delivered babies. And I have about 300 delivered for my credit. And I was good at family practice, but in 1982, when I started having kids, I moved back to Texas, where I'm from. And I took a teaching position at the school in Fort Worth, and after I was there for a couple of years, I ended up being chairman and running the Department of Manipulative Medicine for, for a few years, and designed a three-year residency in, in uh, Manipulative Medicine. It was only the fourth one in the world at the time. Uh, I was on committees where we argued about whether you spelled holism with a W or not. And the term integrative medicine is something I first lectured on in 1983, and I trademarked the term in 1988, and I gave it to Andy Whale, who's a friend of mine of Tucson, in 1993 after I moved to California. But I've been involved in, in trying to explain what osteopathy is for 40 years. The first month I was a family doctor, I had a student for my service. But now my students are running the country. I have people who've been president of the AAO and the AOA, and so on, and all of you precepted with me had the privilege of, of participating in the training of lots and lots of students over the years. Um, I am known around the country for my work with children. When I was in Phoenix, about a third of my practice was babies. And if you go to my website, the videos about my treating children are there. And in 1993, uh, the year I moved to California, it was 92. But I was chairman of the convocation in, in 1993. And the topic for the year was osteopathy in children. And I produced a special video called Osteopathy in Children that I would urge you to look at, in which I tried to meet the objections of MDs to cranial osteopathy head on. I showed a baby with asymmetrical orbits that I made her eyes become symmetrical by taking a sphenovascular compression torsion out of her, the cranial base. I showed a child that stopped having seizures because he had a severely compressed occiput. We had proof on the EEG. I could demonstrate the child was treated. I released the area in Oxford. The child never had another seizure after one treatment. And I had a child that was dropped on his head that was blinded, and I restored his vision through cranial work. But because I was trying to meet the objections of MDs about uh, cranial osteopathy head on, part of the pun, but I, I knew that those were valid intellectual objections and questions about whether there was really anything to it. So I have met them head on with that video. And if you ever want to use a video to argue with people and, and demonstrate that there really is such a thing as, as something substantial to cranial work, watch my videos on osteopathy and children. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Today we're here to talk about some ideas that have, have been long coming for me and that I didn't know all this at the time. Uh, I have a 35-year-old autistic son. And Adam has taught me more about spectrum disorder and autism than I want to know about it. And I'm going to teach you all today what causes it and what causes fibromyalgia and what causes spectrum disorder, uh, um, metabolic syndrome and aging in people. And as osteopaths, you have a unique ability to both understand what I'm going to tell you and then understand how to apply it clinically. That, uh, is not always easy to transmit to an audience uh, with slides and so on because most of the time when I'm talking to MDs, they lack the palpatory training or the autonomic physiology and spinal cord physiology to understand what I'm saying. But uh, you talk about immune dysfunction. Now, what does that mean? We're osteopaths, right? No, that's. We don't hear the term immune dysfunction much, but I'm here to tell you that fibromyalgia and spectrum disorder in children is a dysfunctional immune system. If you don't know this one, I hope that this takes root with some of you, and that is what does osteopathy mean? 
And so many people think it means bone disease, and it doesn't. Os is source, and pathy means suffering, so it means to find the source of suffering which is a much bigger question than which bone is out of one. And the three basic principles of osteopathy are that the body is a unit and that structure and function are reciprocally related and the body tends to heal itself if you understand how it works. Let me get some more to that. I can't read my own slide. Can we get in the last? Yes. Yeah. Do I do that? better. Well, this slide needs to change. This just says that there, as osteopaths, we believe that there's a stage in tissue that precedes disease when it's not functioning correctly and the cells haven't changed yet. When the cells start to change, that becomes disease. You have histologic evidence that the system is now not normal. But at first, it's just dysfunctioning. And believe it or not, somatic dysfunction just means body not working right. Don't tell insurance companies. But in the next hour, we're going to talk about how these concepts about immune dysfunction and so on apply to real clinical situations. So immune diseases and diseases are related to immune dysfunction are going to be discussed in the context of how dysfunction occurs in the immune system. You have two types of immunity. You have cellular immunity, that's T cells for thymus. And as you know, the thymus is two-thirds of the mediastinum in a, a newborn baby, and by the time patients in their 80s, you can hardly find it. It looks like a tag of fat inside the mediastinum. And this is what programs the spleen for T cell function and so on. And yet, it's, you know, you get a lot of press about it because of HIV and people who get sick when the T cells get sick, and yet that's only 20% of your immune system. The other 80% of the immune system is the antibody system. It's the one that's most important in this context is IgG. So this is called humoral immunity. And what most of what we think of as the antibody system is actually produced in the, in the terminal ileum in the small bowel. Eighty percent of the histamine that your body makes is in the last four or five inches of ileum and the first four or five inches of colon. Now stop for a minute. Histamine important? Y'all had that in biochem? You studied a little bit? Any drugs you're studying in pharmacology? Tack into the histamine system, right? Before you skip <coughs> over that, 80% of your histamine comes from the four inches at the bottom of the small bowel and the first four inches of colon. It's also where you make all of your IgG. You don't make IgG anywhere else. You make it in the small intestine. IgE is secretory antibody that's in tears. IgA is secretory antibody in the mucosa. IgM is, you know, released an acute infection, but IgG is the learning antibody. As long as you're being penetrated with antigens and you don't know the name of them, you're going to be using the IgG system to figure it out. And when the immune system is working correctly, if you were in a state of, and this is a hypothetical state in this world, maybe our ancestors lived out in the woods could do it, but if you're in true immune integrity, you don't have to do anything but let your secretory system work. You don't have to learn any new antigens. So IgA uh, and, and IgE and secretory antibodies are handling the boundaries of your, of your cell column. It's when you start to evoke IgG, when you start to be penetrated, that you start to evoke the IgG system. God, these are terrible slides to read. Um, normally, we can maintain our boundaries with secretory antibodies and with roving T cells. They, they rove in the skin and they rove in the lining of the gut. And the roving T cells are your first line of defense against molecules and, and invaders that get into your system. And then uh, as you, once you start to penetrate the mucosa of the gut and get into what's called the submucosa, you evoke a completely different immune state. Because once the submucosa is penetrated, the body knows it's penetrated and now you have foreign proteins or foreign molecules in your serum, and that means you've got invasion underway. Now, the idea that the gut flora could affect health and, and affect our immune systems did not start with naturopathic medicine. It didn't start with the functional medicine people. It didn't start with any of those people. It's not a, a, a modern concept. This stuff began 50 years ago 
when they started feeding antibodies to feedlot cows, and they found that they gained weight 40% faster than cows not fed antibiotics. And then, of course, they said, why? And the, the reason is that the, the cows were spending 40% of their body's energy on, on contending with the presence of the flora, And by using antibiotics to reduce the, the flora, they were taking some of the stress off the organism. And you can infer from this that 40% of the body's energy is spent on dealing with the, the bowel flora. Now, the, the, one of the topics for today's lecture was about the microbiome. And I want to get a couple of things straight about these ideas. The microbiome includes everything that grows on your body, skin, hair, inside and out, and so on. That's everything that can grow on you that's, that's a biological organism. But the gut flora is what I'm most concerned with in this talk because um, the gut flora is what goes sideways and causes all these problems. Now, by now, you, this is well known. You've heard these things about how much more genetic information is in the bowel flora than you have in your genes, how many more cells are there than you have in your cell colony, and so forth. But whenever you talk about the flora just going crooked, it's out of balance. That's all dysbiosis means. One of my students submitted an insurance form, this is probably 20 years ago, to Blue Cross Blue Shield here in California, and he wrote the diagnosis as dysbiosis. And they got very upset about it. To them, dysbiosis was a term that meant quackery. And it, and it had a lot of disrespect for a while. Merck was very down on the term dysbiosis, and they were real negative about it for a while. And now, it's everywhere. You start to hear more and more about it. But the, per the term is dysbiosis. Dysfun dysfunction, like abnormal floral function, if you want to know what biosis is. It's the interplay between the flora and the, and the organism. But dysbiosis just means that the flora is out of balance. And as you're going to learn, fibromyalgia in adults and spectrum disorder in children happens when the flora gets out of whack and the immune system reacts. Now, you, you talk about anybody dysfunction. Remember, you're, you're trying to keep out whatever it is that is getting in that you don't know what it is. But if the mucosa does get penetrated, the, the, the immune state that you have to learn the phrase is secondary immune activation. This is not emphasized, and I want you to understand why. This is a functional state. You're never going to nail that down with a histologic diagnosis. It's not a histologic change you're describing. It's an activation state. And it means that anybody's system is no longer coping with what's coming in. Something's getting past it. And so as long as you are being penetrated by foreign proteins and you don't know what they are, your immune system goes on this alert. And that's called secondary immune activation. It's also the driving force behind autism and behind uh, uh, spectrum disorder and behind fibromyalgia. Now, what happens if the mucosa is penetrating? What, what happens next? Y'all just had all this in physiology and immunology, right? Or you get all these chemotactic factors that are released and so on, right? And the most dominant one, the most important one, is histamine. Now, I already tell you what, what it, uh, where it's produced. So. It's a neurotransmitter and it's an immune factor. And what does it do to, as an immune factor? It calls T cells there. It's chemotactic. It makes them come to the area and attack and eat any foreign proteins that they find there. But they're looking for things that are new. Another thing that histamine is telling your body is to find something new. And that's in the immune system. But this is what it does. It, it, it makes the blood, uh, I mean the white cells, migrate to the area, the roving T cells that are in the lining of the mucosa go there. Now, next thing is, where does all the blood from the gut go first? Up the mesentery, right? And to the liver, okay? And in the, in the original research, what they found was that the degree of penetration of the mucosa was proportional to the engorgement of the mast cells in the mesentery. So if you, if you looked at them, they were all engorged. And with what? inflammatory substrates, tumor necrosis factor, calocrines, histamine, and so on, but also epinephrine from the segmental autonomics osteopathic students. How did the epinephrine get there? See, MDs haven't a clue. To them, it just got there by chance through the blood or something. They all understand something about it, but they don't. Because what does that epinephrine do to blood flow in the messenger? 
it causes what? Vasoconstriction or dilation? Constriction. So what does that do to blood flow to the mesentery? And what does that do to peristalsis in the area? But why would it do that? Because it's being penetrated and it wants time to figure it out. You see what I mean? Physiology all makes sense as you take this apart step by step. And of course, tumor necrosis factor and all these other inflammatory mediators are what are evoked at the segment and the cells migrating and so on. Now, where does all the mesentery blood go next? To the liver. And the liver is uh, the chief clearance of inflammatory stuff coming in from the gut. And when the gut is processing these immune complexes that are coming in, uh, it can handle it and so on. The liver is normal in texture and, and tenderness. But what percentage of patients you see, y'all have already started touching people, what percentage of average people, not your classmates who know something in nutrition, what does an average person have going on in their thoracic spine? Well, you're going to find that five out of six people have a dysfunction at T8 and 9. Did you know that five out of six people make Hashimoto's antibodies? What percentage of people you see out there with congested livers? You're going to find out. But one little factoid that one of y'all's TAs taught me was that 50% of the lymphatic fluid that enters the thoracic duct is coming from the liver. And specifically, these are these immune uh, processes that are coming in from the gut, they're clearing the antibodies, and whatever they say is okay to get past it goes on into the circulation. And that's what the liver's doing, it's clearing this thing. So the visceral reflex at T8 and 9 are what light up on these patients, and you'll see this over and over. When you're doing your histories and physicals, how many people have hot T8s and T9s? Mid thoracic spine. If they're symptomatic and they're in a doctor's office, odds are they're having some of this. And it's five out of six people have immune dysfunction, if you look at it this way, whether whatever disease is accompanying. Now, dysbiosis also causes congestion in the liver, and, and you'll notice that they're, it congests up. You'll see all these people with flared out over thoracics. And if you palpate carefully, it won't be true hepatomegaly. The liver won't be below the costal margin, it'll just be. Not, not down here, this. They walk around like this all the time. You're gonna see it in your classmates. As y'all go out on rotations, you're all gonna have a risk of getting contaminated. If you bloat or get this stuff going on when you're on rotation, you have dysbiosis. And how long does it take to become a disease from being a dysfunctional immune system that causing disease? It varies from person to person. But the gas is because the uh, yeast and the colon bloat. Now, there are two types of bloating. A little pot belly, like some people get, is between the belly button and the pubes. That's where the small bowel is. What causes that? Gram-negative overgrowth of parasites make you get small bowel distension. When they distort, when they bloat on the sides, and they get big like that, that's yeasts, and that's in the colon. And you'll see this all the time, but if you read an article on mesenteric fat, it'll scare the hell out of you, because you'll think all that's fat, and it isn't, it's gas. So one of the things I tell my patients all the time is you'll get your six-pack back about six. Mm -hmm. It works because as you clean out the liver, you give them things to help the liver process the poisons, and if you give them herbs to suppress the yeast, guess what happens to the belly? It goes down, and without doing a single sip, they'll, they'll get their rectus abdominis back. Now, you're osteopathic students, and I can say something like doing manipulation on the liver, and y'all don't roll your eyes. But I want you to know that a lot of doctors don't think that there's anything you can do to the liver. I mean, that's the notion you can manipulate it sounds ridiculous. But they don't understand about the autonomic reflexes to the liver either. Uh, if you don't know anything else to do, work on the diaphragm, release the diaphragm, and treat the segments. But if you are taught percussion techniques, uh, percussion is where you use percussors that are special vibrators. Uh, you can use those to dramatically unclog the liver because you, you can help the percolation through it. And then uh, you can do manipulation and so on to treat and you know, get the, the part back in rhythm with the parts around it. But um, you can do things to treat the liver and so on. As you, I'm sure you had some introduction to visceral manipulation. Now, if you say liver support to most people, including doctors, they will think that you're talking about silymarin and milk thistle. That's not a very good way to help the liver. It works by inducing uh, enzyme P450 to go up. It doesn't do anything that participates directly 
in detoxification. So when somebody says that they're on liver support and they're talking about pomegranates or they're talking about uh, silly marin milk thistle, that's not really liver support. That doesn't do that. You have three uh, detoxification pathways. These probably sailed by you in biochem. They did it for me. It wasn't until later I understood why this was important. But they are hyaluronidization, which means that you make hyaluronic acid, and that's one of the complexes that helps you excrete. There's glycination, where you take glycine and, and attach it, and that's a, a minor detoxification pathway. But the major detoxification pathway, the one that's most important, is sulfonation. That's the enzyme P450 system, and that's where glutathione and NAC come in. Um, glutathione has, as one of its components, cysteine. But they have different, like they, they behave different clinically when you use them in health patients. Uh, NAC, will, if taken orally, will increase glutathione in the serum. But taking oral glutathione doesn't raise it in the serum. Why? Because it's consumed. If you take glutathione orally, the roving white cells in your gut are so thirsty for it, they take it all up and it never gets to the liver. But if you take NAC, it, it can pass the liver. Now, NAC, N-acetylcysteine, I want you to read that second factoid, has been shown to reduce mortality from Tylenol overdose by 30%. I used to work in emergency rooms, and if you've never worked in ER and seen a baby come in who's drunk a bottle of Tylenol. They look perfectly happy. They're sitting there, they, they've had a big bottle of purple grape flavored stuff they think is good. And in three weeks they're going to be jaundiced and needing a liver. It's a horror story. There's nothing you can do, at least until I learned about this. At least now, if you have a child who's drunk a whole quart of NAC, I mean of uh, acetaminophen, you can give them NAC one in three children will survive. That's huge. Now, it can do that with a lethal dose. You can imagine what it does for the average person's toxin load. And what I see repeatedly when I get patients to take in NAC is a dramatic reduction in liver congestion. If you give them 1,500 milligrams of NAC, I would wager you money that no matter what their condition, they don't feel better if they haven't been taking liver support. And this is the most commonly overlooked element of taking care of people. Uh, they'll say liver support and they mean milk thistle and it doesn't work. Well, alpha lipoic acid also helps with detoxification. Now, you can't talk about immune dysfunction and not get to the way that immune stress affects the adrenal axis. What I'm going to teach you all about your adrenals and about your brain and nervous system is something that is going to change the way you understand psychiatry, because once you hear it, psychiatry has a lot of explaining to do. Okay? But this way we get there. Histamine is a neurotransmitter, and your adrenals are autonomic ganglia. What does the neurotransmitter histamine tell your adrenals? We're being penetrated. Okay? So what does the adrenal do if it thinks it's being penetrated? What are the logical effects? Well, would you want to keep your cortisol up in place somebody needs some sugar like your white blood cells? So see, generally histamine turns on the adrenals. And chronic histamine overstimulation can cause chronic hyperadrenal stimulation. And this is one of the reasons, this is probably the main reason that people fail at controlling their hemoglobin A1Cs and stuff like that later, as you'll see. But this is not taught this way. But histamine, if it's there in high amounts in the system, keeps the whole system revved up. And it's commonly produced in food allergies and parasites and other types of infections. Can you go a lot of histamine and you will never know it the way that you're taught to think about this unless somebody comes along and makes you see this. But histamine tells your body we're being penetrated. And so that you're going to have increased adrenaline, increased cortisol, increased uh, aldosterone, all the stress hormones are going to go up. And your blood sugar is going to go up, and your blood pressure is going to go up, and all that stuff because it's chronic stimulation of histamine. Now, as the adrenal stress stress continues, what it, it will eventually raise your blood pressure and raise your circulating sodium blood volume. And locally, adrenaline is a factor of vasoconstriction and lymphoconstriction too. Remember, lymphatics have sympathetic innervation, 
So when this stuff starts happening, it puts all these negative things to immunology and flow through the, the segments that are affected, and it also alters peristalsis and other ongoing things. Now, as I said, I want you to remember 80% of your histamines in the last five inches of the alien and the first five inches of the asymptomatic colon. And giving antihistamines doesn't work. If you say, well, could you treat it with antihistamines? No, it doesn't at all uh, to do that. It clogs them up if you block their actions. It doesn't, that's not the way to do it. One of my patients is a veterinarian, and uh, she used to teach up at Davis. And she's been my patient now for 20 years. But we have wonderful conversations about medicine because she's academically oriented as a vet because she taught veterinary medicine. So one day she walks in and she says, do humans age like cats and dogs through pancreatic insufficiency? I go, well, humans get pancreatic insufficiency, but nobody ever asked me if it was a mechanism of aging. But if you think about it, well, she said that if you have a cat or dog, when they get to be about six or seven years old, there's a subset of them that suddenly gets skinny, they get scrawny looking. And she says it's because you've been overfeeding them protein and you have given them a low-grade pancreatitis and burned out their pancreas. And if you give these dogs digestive enzymes, they put the weight back on it and they never get scrawny as long as you give them enzymes. Well, what's interesting is that we are not taught about the organs like this in the context of aging. Like whether as we get older that these organs wear out, but it does make sense to think about it. Now what is the only diet that's been proven to extend your lifespan by 30% and we've known about it since the 1950s. What is it? Come on, medical students, y'all supposed to know this stuff. What's the only diet that's proven to extend your life expectancy by 30%? What? Any guesses? Not calorie restriction. If you eat 15% less, you'll live 30% longer. Now, why? See, you use up your library of immunity in your gut. Y'all know about polymorphic genes, right? That you use up your copies of genes as you go along, as they become inert, you use the good ones you have left until you run out. And see, if you, if you use it up by using up your immunity in your gut uh, by running a bunch of proteins through it. Now, th now think about this, because we're going to be getting to uh, um, uh, antibody unload antigen unloading in a minute. So dysfunction in the antibody systems can evoke IgG types that sometimes cross-react. Now, let's, let's go down the list. Where, when you take internal medicine, what is the model autoimmune disease that you're taught about? Rheumatoid. What are rheumatoid factors? Where are they from? Where do, you, where do they come from? You know? It's a fraction of IgG. And guess where it's made? A small bowel. Anti-nuclear antibodies used to diagnose lupus. Guess where they're made? The small bowel. And then, of course, Hashimoto's, which is now known to be the most common autoimmune disease. Two and a half times as common as all the other autoimmune diseases put together. And where do the antibodies come from that produce Hashimoto's? The small bowel. Five out of six people make Hashimoto's antibodies at some point. And any patient who has texture changes in the gland, cysts, nodules, they've got it. Goiter, they've had it at some point. And if you test for the antibodies, you cannot cookbook. You can't say the antibodies are there, so they've got it, or the antibodies are not there, which proves they don't have it. If they've got texture changes in the gland, if they've got like really abnormal thyroid function tests, they've got Hashimoto's. You didn't catch the antibodies. They, they, see, the way it works is something in the gut elicits their production, then they react on the tissue and cause the inflammation, and then the thyroid release gets erratic, but by the time that happens, this, the production of antibodies may have already dampened out by whatever you vote from. So you can't cookbook with Hashimoto's antibodies. You have to always be suspicious of Hashimoto's, and if you have a thyroid abnormality, you almost have a given that they have it. And some endocrinologists quibble over whether there's a difference between graves and really bad Hashimoto's. The, the change that they cite is the reason that you can prove that they're distinct is elicited by the Hashimoto's hyperinflammatory condition in the gland. And I argue that, that Graves is a downstream effect of Hashimoto. Y'all can argue that with your teachers. That's what I believe. 
remember that it is the most common autoimmune disease of all, and you're going to see it all the time. Now, if you think of it as a dysfunction of the immune system, that your body's responding to an antigen getting in, and it's accidentally going off on your thyroid, then you can see how gut infections or food allergies could induce the antibodies. And if you could figure out what is inducing the antibodies and take that out of the system, either treat the infection or remove the food, guess what? In a high percentage, the antibodies go away and stay gone. So sometimes, Hashimoto's is reversible. Now, I mentioned a moment ago about the concept of antigen unloading. And it's like, how many straws can you take off the camel's back before you can get back on his feet? Now, when you eat food and so on, you're taking in antigens, which is biological information. And you're asking your immune system to sort it out and figure out what it is. And some antigens are more, you know, foods are more difficult to process than others. There's an MD in Sebastopol named Elson Haas. He has a center in Marin called the Preventive Medicine Center there at Lucas Valley Road. And Dr. Haas has written several books on detoxification. One of his books is called The False Fat Diet. And in this book, he takes patients off dairy, wheat, eggs, sugar, and something else. There are five foods that he, he takes them off. And the average patient loses 12 pounds the first week. Now, that's not really like losing weight. What's happening, though, is that if you give them a simpler diet to process immunologically, it so reduces the load on the liver, it so reduces the stress on the immune system, that the average person loses 12 pounds of, of backed up fluid from their gut in a week. That's how important this clogging up is in patients. And you're going to see this all the time when you're practicing clinical uh, medicine. But antigen unloading is the idea that you can reduce the complexity of the food that comes in. Now, you'll hear all kinds of anecdotes about diets that people swear got them over fibromyalgia, or swear got them over Hashimoto's, and so on. And what are those diets usually? They usually go on one food. Or they'll go on a real simple dietary measure where they, 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 they reduce the antigen complexity of what they're bringing in. I, if a patient asks me about this, I'll tell them to make a, a chicken soup and eat it every day for like four days. Eat nothing but chicken soup for four days. So that they, they don't rotate and change the antigen demands all the time. Because the more complicated your food is, the more stress you put on this part of your immune system. And so when you, when you do this, or if you have a patient do a fast, the way that that helps their immune system is that you're reducing the antigen load coming in. You see what I'm saying? And if they're in an activated immune state, that gives them the chance to back out of that revved up immune state. And it works in some cases. So you have to look and see what they're loaded up with. Do stool cultures, look for ova and parasites. And parasites evoke enormous amounts of histamine. Anytime you see a patient who's hyperhistaminic, like you scratch their skin and they almost have a, like a, a dermatographism, suspect something evoking histamine and, and uh, be suspicious of parasites. If they've got things that look like freckles, but they aren't on the backs of their hands, on brown blotches that we call liver spots, suspect parasites. That's the most common cause of that. So you can see these things when you're doing physicals and once you're out on rotations. And you may or may not be talking about these associations. Uh, when you decide how to treat them, you have to treat parasites first because they bore through the walls of things and spread germs around. You treat bacteria next because antibiotics can cause yeast overgrowth, and you treat yeast last. And uh, the things you do to help it. But, but uh, I also do an IgG food panel. Now let's stop for a second and talk about food allergies. I had a patient come to me who was in her mid 50s who had been a Kaiser kid her whole life. She was born in a Kaiser hospital. She's conceived in a Kaiser parking lot, I guess. I mean, she's a Kaiser kid. That last part was a joke. But anyway, she was allergic to dairy, wheat, and eggs. And of course, in the Kaiser system, there's no such thing as food allergies. So when she came to see me and I did the tests and found out what she was allergic to, I took her off the foods and she felt a lot better. So she goes to her primary at Kaiser and tells him what I'm doing with uh, taking her off these foods that I tested she had IgG allergies for. Him. And he says to my patient after she gives him her testimonial that I feel so much better, he says, I don't believe in food allergies. 
Now that puts the patient in an awful position. But of course, even though he's listening to her say, I feel much better for doing this, her primary, her MD is saying, I don't believe in food allergies, this is nonsense. So, he sent her to the Kaiser Dietary Department in Santa Rosa. Well, little did he know that they had a Bowman School of Clinical Nutrition graduate there. And she got my patient and she says, this is wonderful, can we refer to this guy? Because I was doing IgG food testing, she comprehended what I was doing. And the Kaiser system wouldn't let her refer out to me. And the primary didn't like the report one iota when the, the patient came back saying, she said I should do what Dr. Hall was advising. He said, I'm going to send you to a real allergist. So he sent her to their allergy department, and guess what he ordered? Come on, medical students. What would an allergist order if he was asked, does this patient have a food allergy? First of all, what does an allergist in Kaiser get asked that question for? Why are they ever asked about it? Because they don't want somebody who's peanut allergic to have an anaphylactic reaction. What tests would you do if you want to rule out anaphylaxis from food allergy? IgE. IgE food testing. And if you're allergic to cucumbers in your tears, you're super allergic to cucumbers, okay? But that wasn't the question. See, the, the guy didn't understand. The primary didn't understand my question, nor did the allergist. Because I was asking, why is her immune system revved up all the time? And they're asking, is she going to have a food reaction that's going to make her have anaphylaxis? That's not the same question. And yet, see how food allergy gets miscommunicated when you start talking to doctors about it? We're not talking about food allergy that evokes that type of histamine and acute allergic reaction. We're talking about foods that are screwing up their immune system and keeping their immune system activated. And that's what this is about. It's about activation. And then remember, once you're in secondary immune activation, if you keep encountering antigens that evoke IgG, you will stay in immune activation. They don't have to be the ones that 